welcome this morning to the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we will be um, preparing for our crop, our crop walk after the service, and you'll hear a bit more about that at the end of the service. So at this time, I invite you to stand in body or spirit as you are able <clears throat> to confess our sins and to acknowledge God's forgiveness. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the spirit who makes our joy complete. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. We are afraid to risk For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The first reading is from the fifth chapter of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning the, his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Be to God. We'll now read responsibly from Psalm 80. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. The second reading is from the third chapter of Philippians. Paul writes, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whoever gains I have, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of, for the prize of heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect the produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, and it will crush anyone whom it falls, on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, Terrible, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. At this time, I would like to invite uh, the young and the young at heart to come forward for children's sermon. Sermon on the Steps. small but mighty group this morning. Good. Okay, so I want to talk to you this morning about forgiveness, okay? Have you ever needed to be forgiven? Did you ever do anything wrong and you needed to be forgiven? Yeah, me too. Have you ever done anything wrong? And yeah, okay. Okay. And were you happy when you were forgiven? Did you maybe make the same mistake again and need to be forgiven a second time? I know I have. I know I have. Okay. So when I was reading about, about the lessons this morning, I, I do a lot of reading before I put together the lessons, and I came upon this story about a man named Thomas Edison. Who knows who Thomas Edison? You might not know who Thomas... You know what he invented? He invented many things, but he invented this little thing, a light bulb, exactly. This is a spare light bulb 
from my counter. It's for an appliance, so it's a little, little one. Um, well, the story goes like this. To make the first light bulb, it took a whole bunch of people a lot of time. They were just kind of like making it up as they went along. They knew what they wanted it to do, but they weren't quite sure how to get it to work. So it took them, turns out it took them like two days, two days to make one light bulb. You think it takes two days now? No, I don't think so either. But it took them two days to make this light bulb. So they were downstairs in the lab, and they wanted to go upstairs and take it and put it in and see if it would work. So they gave this light bulb to a, to a young boy, OK? And he carried it up the stairs so carefully. But when he got to the top step, he tripped. And he dropped the light bulb, and it broke. Light bulbs are very fragile, so it broke. So Thomas Edison and all of the lab guys had to go back downstairs, spend another two days making another light bulb. It was not easy, but they did it. And then they had to get it upstairs. So guess what? Thomas Edison gave it to the same young boy, he gave him a second chance to carry that light bulb to the top. And this time it worked. So that's one way to get, thank you, I didn't drop it and neither did you, that's good. Um, that's one way to show forgiveness. How many times does God forgive us? Okay, well, I, have, I expected a whole crowd, so I have a whole big basket of popcorn. Can he have popcorn? Okay. So, this is all forgiveness. Each one of these pop kernels is the way that God forgives us. So I want you to take one. God forgives us. Will you take one for him? Thank you. Okay. So God forgives us, but then there's all this other forgiveness, right, that God can, God can share with us. God gives us chance after chance, popcorn kernel after popcorn kernel, to be able to be forgiven. So I just want you to think about that this morning as you eat one little popcorn kernel. But I'm going to put the rest of this popcorn in the back for, for the, our social time. So you'll be able to get a handful of it then, OK? So that's how often God forgives us, many, many times. Once at a, one at a time, but many times. There's no end to God's forgiveness. So let's give thanks. Did you like that one little kernel? Yeah, you can have more later. OK, so good and gracious God, <laughs> we thank you with our whole hearts for the forgiveness that you share with us, for the second chances, the third chances, the fourth chances. Help us always to remain um, sorry for our errors, to ask for your forgiveness, because we know, Lord, if we are truly sorry and we ask for your forgiveness, it will be granted, because there is no end to your grace. And all God's children said, amen. amen. You can eat that one little kernel. There you go. You're going to make it last, right? Well, there'll be a, the whole basket will be in the back. That was kind of a tease, wasn't it? So, you might think that God would have given up on gardening after how badly things went in Eden when the caretakers of that luxurious face had to be sent away for disregarding their instructions. But no, once again, in the scripture appointed for today, we hear about God's gardening efforts. In Isaiah, God is the lover, the one who prepares the soil, the one who plants the grapes. This ballad from Isaiah begins kind of gently singing of a farmer who worked hard to ensure a good and prosperous harvest. Only in the last few verses do we hear a more sinister message. In the psalm, God is the gardener too, the one who transfers the vine from Egypt to the mountains where the great cedars grow. But again, deep within that text lies a deeper and more ominous message. And in the parable from today's gospel, God is the landowner, 
the one who rents his vineyards to tenants in return for a portion of the crop when it's harvest, entrusting the vineyard to unreliable caretakers who have more of a desire to raise havoc than grow grapes. It seems that God is a persistent gardener, one who makes the same mistakes over and over again. Or maybe, stated in a different way, God is a persistent gardener, one who never gives up on the seeds that he's planted. The parable in today's gospel is what our English teachers refer to as an allegory. Now, in case it's been a few years since you sat in a ninth grade, ninth grade English class, let me refresh your memory. An allegory is a literary device in which a person, a place, or an event can be interpreted to represent a hidden meaning, one with a moral or political significance. In this morning's gospel, Matthew is expanding on the theme of last week's gospel about the two sons, remember? The one who did what he said he would not do, and the one who didn't do what he said he would do. Well, the setting is the same. It takes place outside the temple. The characters are the same, too. The chief priests and the elders, Jesus, and those who had gathered to hear Jesus teach and preach. And the struggle is the same, a confrontation over authority issues, who had the right to speak in the temple, and who gave them that authority. Well, the conflict was raging between Jesus, the chief priests and the elders, and the people. By using an allegory in this context, Matthew is making it very clear that the religious leaders had failed to accept the authority of Jesus and would therefore forfeit what was once theirs, the kingdom promised by God. Matthew begins by having Jesus recall the verses, paraphrasing them, if you will, from Isaiah, the verses we just heard Lynn read for us. Matthew wants to make the parallel between the vineyard and Israel perfectly obvious to the listeners. And you can bet that the first century crowd, well, they got it. They understood just who was who in this allegory. But Jesus isn't finished with the story yet. He tells them that when the time comes to collect the harvest, the landowner sends a series of servants only to have the first one beaten the second one killed, and the third one stoned. Finally, out of desperation and believing that a member of his own family would be respected and honored and be safe from this violence, the landowner sends his very own son to collect the fruits of the vineyards. But even that doesn't go as the landowner planned. His son, the heir of the vineyard is brutally murdered in the hope that now the kingdom would belong to the workers, not to the rightful, rightful owner, the landowner. In this story, Jesus is teaching that God is in charge, that all things come from God, and that God is first and foremost a merciful God. In this parable, the only way to suffer God's wrath is to live as if God did not exist, exactly as the tenants did. This allegory seems to assume that the tenants and those listening to Jesus believed in benevolent authority, but when you believe you cannot, even should not, be held accountable and even believe that you are the center of the universe, then grace is experienced as cheap and weak. These terrible tenants, these crummy caretakers never own up to their own dereliction of duty. In fact, they avoid any responsibility at all. They blame each other, one another. And their actions, or lack of actions in taking care of the vineyard, result in chaos and violence. It seems that even in Jesus' day, believing that you had rights without responsibilities was a dangerous way to live and resulted in chaos, violence, turmoil, madness, even anarchy. 
The world we find ourselves living in today is a perfect example. Actions must have consequences, good or bad. The laws of physics tell us that for every action, there is a reaction. Greed, selfishness, self-centeredness, and self-indulgence, well, they blind us and can keep us from seeing and feeling the grace of God. Our war-weary planet shudders with the blasts of bombs and bullets from Ukraine to Israel to Gaza, from the streets of Philadelphia to the streets of Allentown and even Quakertown, and across our nation and the world. We are too often surrounded by racial bigotry and hatred our society is fragmented and seemingly out of control. Many of us are scared. And when we are scared, we often start looking for someone to blame, like those irresponsible tenants. There would be no hope for this world, except that the gardener is also a lover. Gardening and loving make a natural combination. Gardeners plant and nurture and tend, and so do lovers. Gardeners envision the growth that is possible, the fruits that the future can bring, and so do lovers. Lovers look at each other and see what others often miss, the beauty that's more than skin deep, the grace shared without a price, the gifts that are waiting to blossom if only they are affirmed and supported. Sometimes, we discourage this vision, don't we? This vision held by lovers. We call it puppy love or a romantic illusion. We know, sadly, sometimes from personal experience that in time, this idealistic vision will fade and a more realistic vision will take its place. There is another way to look at this vision of love. When we are in love, the vision we have of our beloved may very well be accurate. Because through the eyes of love, we see the other clearly. We see the beauty and the gifts that they have. And we understand what that person is truly created to be and to become. Unfortunately, most of the time, our human nature tends to focus on the failings and the faults of others. And we miss the true wonder of what each and every one of us were created to be. Unfortunately, our human nature so often makes it hard for us to extend grace, the gift of grace extended to us by our loving and forgiving God. You see, the gift of grace is only possible through the help of another gift, the gift of faith. The tenants didn't understand this. The landowner thought that, landowner thought that his benevolent authority was simply misunderstood. He fully expected the tenants to figure out their mistake. He rationalized the murder and the abuse of his servants and assumed that his son would be respected. The truth is that the landowner's authority and generosity was simply always beyond human reasoning and understanding. It required the gift of faith. Mercy is always unreasonable. And divine mercy is the most unreasonable of all. Just maybe, this is why God has not given up on gardening. He has entrusted the garden to us. God sees us, not simply as a worker in the garden, but as God's beloved. God sees that we have it in us to tend and nurture the garden and to bring forth justice, to treat this island planet Earth in a way that does not destroy, but results in the fulfillment of God's great desire for creation. Just maybe, that's why God has never given up on gardening, never given up on us, and never will, even after Eden. Amen.
us profess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed as it's printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of all grace, you are the source of life and joy. Strengthen the resolve of your church throughout the world, that together we press on toward the goal of your heavenly call in Jesus Christ. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all creation, you plant and nourish the earth as your own precious vineyard. Bless fields and orchards and the hands of those who labor in them, that your people are fed with an abundant harvest of good fruit. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all the earth, you desire peace and justice between nations and peoples. Guide leaders of nations, states, provinces, and cities, that they faithfully govern your people with wisdom, integrity, and compassion. God of grace, God of all compassion, in Christ, you lovingly poured yourself out like wine for your people. Have mercy on all who mourn, who struggle with their mental health, who cry out for justice, who hunger, and all in any need, especially Denise, Victoria, those with ongoing prayer needs, and those we name before you now. God of grace. God of all steadfastness, you set Christ as the cornerstone and foundation of the church. Build up this congregation as living stones, that it stands in the community as a witness to your enduring faithfulness and love. God of grace. For what else do the people of God pray? God of peace and forgiveness, we pray for your wounded creation and for your hurting children. Repay for peace throughout the world. God of grace. Hear our prayer. God of all hope, the saints who came before us lived and died with their hearts fixed on you. We give you thanks for their faithful witness, and we wait with hope for the great day when we join their voices in praise. God of grace. Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. And let's take a moment to share a sign of the Lord's peace with each other.
God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed from us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, drink, and live.
Please stand in body or spirit. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by his food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, for none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for a couple of announcements. I'm not going to read them to you. You can read them yourselves. But I do want to say thank you to Beth Jasinski for sharing her musical talents and her gift with us this morning. Um, the crop walk is today, and um, if you are walking, you need to be here to sign up at 1245. If you are volunteering, we would like for you to be here at 1230. So you have time to run home, get some lunch, and then get back. Don't forget to sign up for the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. Have anybody, Kelly, have we had any sign-ups for the Phantoms? OK, cool. All right, are there any other announcements for the good of our time together this morning? No? Then I invite you to stand as you are able in body or spirit. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, the name above all names, and the spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.
god is at work in you.